A little info beforehand. I decided to split this project into two videos, because the first one, this one, is really long-winded and the Rings version 1.0 didn't really turn out satisfactory. If you still want to watch it, that's awesome and I thank you. But if you just want a quick summary and move right to the much better looking rings, then feel free to click the video on screen or use the link in the description. Enjoy! Locket Daughter of Freyda, Grand Voice of the Kibouac. Deep carmine red on oily black skin. A beacon of power and dominance. Hello there and welcome to another video where I make rings inspired by characters from Sam Fenner's upcoming book, The August Few. I initially wanted to ditch the voiceover, but as stuff got more and more convoluted, eh, it's probably better to just explain stuff. Like, why do I suddenly need gravel? We'll get to that later. In this episode, because let's face it, it is a series now, we're gonna take a good look at Locket. She's the ruler of the areas known as the Underbirth and the Glaze, and she's leading these parts of the Kibouac into a new age of striving minds. But let's not delve too deep into who Locket is, that'll be explained in the book. Or, well, if you really want a good first impression of her, you can go over to Sam's channel and watch her voice test video. As for this one, let's look at her color scheme, for that will be the most important part when you're making something inspired by a character. Locket's color scheme is a classic red on black design, simple yet very expressive. These were going to be our main colors for the ring, but then I came across a picture of an older render of the skin colors, the base is still a dark grey, but this version has subtle hues of blue and purple, giving Locket's skin a look reminiscent of an annealed piece of metal. Which is kinda cool in my opinion, and so that's the version that I'm gonna try and recreate. If you look closely, her face and neck are also covered in specks of greyish white, which I decided I also wanted to represent in the ring. A decision that bit me in the backside rather viciously later on, considering the amount of extra work and workarounds that took, but one after the other. Now, since I wanted to go for a bit of a different style, and I figured with red and black I can't simply repeat the marbling technique I used in the Celia rings, I'm gonna pre-prepare the highlights so I can pour the base colors over them later on to create more of a clear and sharp separation. For set highlights, I mixed up a batch of resin and added various shades of solid red pigment until I got a nice, deep blood red. And of course, adding the obligatory red pearlescent powder. And here's already the first part where it gets complicated. For this technique to work, I need to have the highlights have a shape that is as random as possible, whilst still being able to distribute them as uniformly as possible in the mold. So here's what I came up with. I pulled the resin up into syringes and let it sit for six and a half hours, I think it was. This literally came down to plus minus 20 minutes, too much curing time and it won't come out of the syringes anymore, too little and it'll be too thin to maintain shape. In the meantime, I've made this adapter to turn my drill press into an arbor press. The reason being that the resin, even though you could technically still squeeze it out with your hands, would you really want to? Yeah, me neither. As the saying goes, work smarter, not harder. Insert the syringe into the adapter and use the drill chuck to press down the piston. The resulting resin strands can then be squeezed onto a sheet of acrylic where they can be set aside to cure for another couple of hours. Just look at the way the syringe piston bends and buckles. It really goes to show how much force is necessary to get the resin out. I'm really glad for that idea with the drill press. Once the strands have reached the desired hardness, that is when they don't change their shape anymore, I can easily peel them off the acrylic sheet. But they're not done yet. To randomize the shape even more, I'm gonna twist them into curls using a cordless drill. Just clamp them lightly in the chuck, hold on to the other end and slowly twist. Stick it down with a piece of tape, and repeat. Now they can finally be left to fully cure for several more days. This whole thing got real intricate real fast. I had to literally stay up all night to check on this stuff. Uh, the things you do to try and impress people. Anyway, so the curlies have now finally all cured and I can take them off the acrylic sheet one final time to cut them into smaller pieces. Are you bored yet? Oh, there's gonna be so much more. You see, now I have all these little red curlies, which I could simply dump into the mold and pour the base colors on top. 
There is a problem, however. Or, not really a problem directly, but something that could lead to problems with the finish ring. The surface is really smooth, and when you're trying to bond something together, like it will be the case with the curls and the base colors later, you ideally want to have a rough surface finish, lest the two parts separate easily under stress. I've already tested this method, and here you can see that the test ring, after dropping it down a flight of stairs multiple times, always broke exactly across the surfaces where the highlight parts meet the other resin. So leaving the surface finish smooth and shiny would be less than ideal. But how would I go about doing this? Well, I'm not really inclined to sand down each and every individual part. Luckily, I don't have to. Remember the gravel I mentioned at the beginning? Now we finally reached the point where I need it. The gravel is going to be my abrasive medium, and as so often, the garden provides. <clears throat> I'm sure nobody's going to miss a handful. The idea is to add the gravel to the curlies and shake them up a bit so the gravel can abrade the resin in a process called tumbling. All I gotta do is... Yeah, how about no? If you wanna tumble something, why not use an actual tumbler? Yeah, I happen to have this lying around for grinding and polishing gemstones. I know, I know, I'm the man with a thousand hobbies. And don't worry, I'm not gonna go into detail here. Just open the drum, add curlies, add gravel, Add water, close the drum, and hit the go button. Stuff's now been tumbling for about four hours. The surface doesn't look as rough as I hope, but definitely not smooth and shiny anymore. That'll do, I guess. Just to be safe, I'm also going to degrease them by using my favorite chemical, after gasoline of course, brake cleaner. Honestly, you just gotta love brake cleaner. Even provides heating for the workshop. We are entering the cold season again after all. Moving on to the white highlights. For those, I wanted to try a less convoluted method and just poured my resin mixture onto a crinkled up sheet of aluminum foil. Which I regretted after curing because the resin bonded surprisingly well with the foil. Just look at this clip and imagine lots and lots of swearing in German. After this ordeal, I finally get everything for the highlights and I can get to mixing up the base colors. Find something simple for once. We are going to need a scale, mixing cups, stirring stick, our mold, the highlights, the resin, of course, pigments, lots of them, and paper towels. Lots of them. I start by mixing a batch of resin mixed with solid black dye and a pigment called Black Hole Pearl. Honestly, everything space related goes super well with Kibwekin characters. This main batch is then split up into two containers where another small amount of blue and purple pigment is added which will hopefully make a very subtle marbling effect when I pour everything together in the mold. And speaking of molds... Yes, I have acquired a new toy! I finally jumped aboard the 3D printing train and adopted one of these fiendish little machines into my household which now allows me to just print semi-see-through molds so I, and you by extent, can actually see what's going on during casting. Very convenient. And check out this awesome pigment rack I've designed. I'll hopefully keep my desk a little bit more orderly. So without further ado, now that we got everything, let's get in some resin pouring ASMR. Enjoy!
While the resin is happily curing within the pressure pot, I can move over to the lathe and start working on the ring core. Yes, these rings are going to be a two-part system with a stainless steel core and resin shell. Especially since various rings I've made in the past proved to be more fragile than I had anticipated. Granted, I'm not exactly gentle with them. I'm not gonna take any chances with these ones, so this 1mm thick core is going to provide tons of stability. I've already completely shaped and polished it, because if I was to do that later, I'd have to clamp the ring on the outside again, risking damage to the resin shell. It's a couple of days later and I've demoted the resin bar, with the mold of course fighting me every step on the way, as was expected given that it is 3D printed plastic instead of pliable silicone. In the end though, it didn't stand a chance against my uh, careful application of destructive force. And it revealed a piece of pure Loketium. And I'm very pleased with how the colors turned out. Notice how the blue and the purple actually form two different sides instead of mixing together too much? I kinda like that. As for how the highlights will turn out, only the lathe will tell. First I'm using a large drill to remove the bulk of material on the inside. Then I'll switch to an internal chisel and slowly creep up to the diameter of the ring core. The final cuts have to be very precise, so I'm only removing 5 hundredths of a millimeter at a time. Always checking with the core after every pass. If the diameter is too small, it obviously won't fit. But if it's too big, it'll be next to impossible to glue the two parts together correctly. Basically, there will be too large of a gap that's gonna trap air, and besides looking crappy, it's, it'll compromise the bond. There we go, that seems about right. Next up, I'm gonna pre-machine the outside, leaving a bit of extra material on there for safety. The rest will be removed after gluing. Now I just have to part it off and the pre-machine shell is ready. The steel core is 7mm in width, so I'll leave it a bit longer in order to have some wiggle room later. You'll see what I mean. To glue the core and the shell together, I'm using my friction clamp again. Knowing that it's about to get messy, I'm putting a layer of grease on the rubber to keep it from bonding to the ring. I've had this happen before. After putting the core on the clamp, I'm carefully wiping it down with brake cleaner to get rid of any grease that might have gotten onto it. The next part is a very nerve-wracking one because, well, I know it's called super glue for a reason, but this stuff's on another level. It bonds almost instantaneously. I have one chance and one chance only to get this right. Drum roll, please. Phew, almost lost it there. Okay, I'll let the glue do its work and get back to it in a few hours, just to be sure. As I mentioned before, I don't want to clamp the ring on the outside anymore. So, in order to take off the excess material and bring it down to its final width, I'm just gonna sand it down on this flat piece of glass. It only takes a few minutes. Back in the lathe, I have to finish the outside diameter and chamfer the edges to help with the shape. And lastly, there's sanding. I'm starting with 200 grit, then moving up to 1000, followed by 2000, and finally 3000. That's really all I need. I've also acquired this new awesome buffing compound that acts as a sort of pre-polish. 
That expedites the whole thing even further. Just a quick finishing touch on the cotton wheel, and we're done. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't like how the pattern turned out. The red highlights are cool, and if the lighting's just right, you can spot the subtle interplay of blue and purple in there, but the shape and pattern of the white highlights really doesn't blow me away. But, oh well, that's just the way it goes with experiments like that. As I was making these rings though, I devised another plan that yielded a far better outcome. That however will get its own video, as I figured this one's already long enough. If everything worked out, I'll have these two uploaded at the same time, so you can go watch it right now. Links are in the description, and maybe on screen if I figure out how that works. I hope you liked this somewhat long-winded video anyways. I'ma go clean up the workshop now. Cheers, and goodbye.